most believers have greater faith in the return of Christ than they do in the power of the gospel. And the concept behind that statement is the fact that we know Jesus is coming back, and when he does, he'll fix everything. Instead of us believing that the power of the gospel that's been given to us is what fixes everything. So good. We're so blessed to have Jonathan and Cindy as part of our part of our house. Bless them. These guys are amazing. <clears throat> they they know what it is to really lay their life down and go into tough places. So we're we're just so privileged. Thanks thanks for what you're putting together for us. Um, I've got just a few minutes left and and uh, got a couple of thoughts to uh, to share with you. Um, Open your Bibles, if you would, to Matthew 28, even if you can quote the passage, look at it anyway, and uh, Matthew 28, and then Acts chapter 1, so we're going to look at two portions of Scripture, and I'm going to read, uh, while you're turning uh, in your Bibles, I'm going to read um, a favorite uh, psalm of mine. Psalm 22 is considered the mess- a messianic uh, psalm, it's about the death of Christ, and it ends with <clears throat> these words. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. That's an extraordinary statement. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall worship before you. For the kingdom is the Lord's, and he rules over the nations. All the prosperous of the earth shall eat and worship. And it goes on. Promises like this are not simply to be read and uh, applauded. They're to be, they're invitations. You know, they're invitations. They can either stay there on the page or they can become an active part of our prayer life. Uh, something, uh, one, of the, one of the most amazing, uh, here's the hard part of praying for nations and praying for uh, unreached people groups, etc. is you don't get daily feedback to keep you encouraged. You have to do it because of the call of God and who you are in Christ. If you need the constant daily motivation, you know, praying for the sick is easy because you see breakthroughs, it keeps you motivated. But, uh, but on, this, on the bigger scale, you have to be motivated out of an identity issue, a call of God. And uh, missions groups, uh, a number of years ago, I don't remember now, I've, I've heard before, but I, I think it's like back in the 80s, maybe 70s, but certain missions groups around the world started targeting what's called the 1040 window. It's a, it's a, uh, we saw the map earlier. The 1040 window is a, a, a geographical section of planet Earth where a large part of the unreached people groups live, as you saw on, on, the, on the map. But what happened is prayer ministry groups started targeting, they started realizing that's where the, most of the people are, so we need to pray for them. So if you can imagine now 10, 20, 30 years later of these groups constantly praying into that, we have story upon story upon story of, of people who live in that area who have never heard the gospel. They have a man in white show up in their dreams. They'll have a, a vision, they'll have an encounter with what they call the man in white. And it has become so common, um, it's not to replace the going because they still have to hear the gospel, but to have these encounters uh, with the man in white it's become so common that I know of a guy who goes in front of a mosque and he just stands there and when people come in, he says, have you seen the man in white? If they say yes, he says, stand over here and I'll tell you who he is. And then if they, if they haven't seen the man in white, they actually, they, he, they just go into the mosque. So after everybody showed up and they got a pile of folks here that have seen the man in white, he then goes over and shares the gospel. Tells them who, who the man in white is. It's, it's amazing. But how does that happen? The, the atmosphere over these parts of the world are shifting because of long-term prayer. Long-term prayer. It's not just the, you know, the, the, the casual prayer on a mission Sunday, which is important, but it's, it's the long-term focus to say, you know what, we want him to get his full reward. We want Psalms 22 verse 27 that I read to you moments ago to be fulfilled where all the families of the earth bow before him, where all the nations, all the ethnos, all the people groups of the earth, not just uh, the 200 nations that exist, all the different people groups. And so this is who we are as a church family. Um, 
here, let's read these two passages and then I'll try to, uh, I'll, I'll, do, I'll do more next week uh, and uh, hopefully it'll make more sense then, but let me plant the seeds for it right now. In Matthew 28, we have what we refer to as the Great Commission, starts in verse 18. Jesus came and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore, make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them, them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And I remind you, he commanded them, heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out devils. It was never supposed to end. Is this mic on? Yeah. It was never supposed to end. It was never supposed to end. It's a part of the gospel. He said this gospel will be preached all nations, not 200 nations, but the ethnos, the people groups. And when the gospel of the kingdom is preached in the gospels, it's followed with miracles, signs, and wonders. So the prophecy that this gospel will be preached in all the world and then the end shall come is a gospel that is demonstrated with power. It's a gospel that illustrates the resurrection of Jesus. <clears throat> Teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. I love that last phrase. One preacher said, he don't fly for that reason. Because Jesus said, lo, I'm with you always. It's, 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 that's, that's a corny joke, but it wasn't mine. I'm just, I'm just the messenger. Acts chapter uh, one, Acts chapter one, verse uh, eight. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in all Judea, Samaria, to the end of the earth. All right, so here's the deal. We are required to walk in authority and power. It's what Jesus did, it's what he illustrated. He commissioned his disciples. Luke chapter one, verse nine, he gave them authority and power. But then when he ascended to heaven, they had to get their own. They were under his deputized anointing, if you will. And so uh, in Matthew 28, he shows up and he announces all authority's been given to me. He passes that authority on and it is in everybody's life in this room in the measure we've said yes to his mission. Authority comes in the commission, but power comes in the encounter. Authority comes in the commission, power comes in the encounter. And so Jesus received power when the Spirit of God came upon him at his water baptism. Very next chapter, we see him functioning in miracle signs and wonders. There's a connection there. Matthew 28, all authority's been given to me. Go therefore. Luke's version adds this part. Don't leave Jerusalem till you're clothed with power. Luke wrote Luke, go figure, and Acts. Put the two together, you see a seamless story. Here's my point. Authority and power are both essential to living and demonstrating the gospel. But in the two champion verses that deal with these subjects, they are both tied to our influence on the nations. Come on, yeah. Matthew 28, disciple nations because of authority. Acts chapter one, you'll receive power, be witnesses in all the earth, all the nations. The whole point is authority and power is what qualifies us to influence nations. And the, the, the bottom line is, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you more per personal stuff uh, probably next week, but the, the missions thing has been a huge part of my life as long as I can remember. I was, I was you know, weaned on it, so to speak. And so we, we just, we always had missionaries in our home. It was always a huge part of our life. It's just Benny and I, we, we gave pretty extreme before we even married and we brought the two uh, to, together, the commit, commitment to world missions. It's who we are. And, and it's, it's, it's not optional. You know, how we do it is different. You, 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 everyone can pray. Most everyone can send, that's giving. And some get to go. Yeah, yeah. Well, actually, everybody gets to go because this is a nation that needs discipling. Yeah. <laughs> so when, when we dismiss you in a couple of minutes, you're gonna go into all the world and preach the gospel of the kingdom. 
But this is, this is who we are. And recognizing that it is actually in our DNA, that he wrote in, in his word the promises where entire nations, people groups would be brought to him. That, that is coursing through his own veins. That's his own prayer life, if you will, is to intercede and to pray for us and to pray for the nations. That's our privilege. So what I'm hoping that all of us get to do is up our, upgrade our, first of all, our sense of identity and responsibility for nations. You know, maybe the Lord highlights a nation to you or a missionary or both. And then just on a regular basis throughout the week, you just start praying. Maybe pick up a newspaper. Ooh, but you pick up a newspaper. <laughs> you, sorry. I manifested for a moment. I, I think I'm okay now. And, and you see an article about that nation that gives you insight on how to pray. It's, it's, it's a very significant thing. So, all right, go ahead and stand. <laughs> yes, Lord. You know, um, we're, we're gonna. I, I'm gonna close in prayer here in just a second. So hold on, if you wouldn't mind. <clears throat> but you know, the 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 big deal is that there there obviously could be people in this room right now that have have never have never given your life to Christ, have never received His forgiveness, don't know what it is to. Be Bible calls it born again. It's where you change from the inside out. And if there's anybody in this room, before we pray for us as a a, a crowd of missionaries, um, I, I want to give this opportunity. If there's anyone here that would just say, Bill, I don't want to leave the room. I don't want to leave the property until I know what it is to know God, to be forgiven, to be adopted into his family. If there's anyone in that place, just quickly put your hand up right now and just by doing that, you're saying, Bill, I don't want to leave until I know I have found peace with God, what it is to be forgiven. Do so real quickly. And I'll wait just, just a moment. I just want to make sure everyone has the opportunity for this. We also have so many people online uh, that have been healed this week. The Randy Clark Conference was outrageously wonderful. and So many people got healed online. And and it, it may be that some of you uh, who are online would say, I, I don't know Jesus and I want to. Just write in the, in the chat box and there'll be a pastor there to help you. All right, let's just pray. Father, I ask that you would impart a grace for missions. Um, even those who have never even given it a second thought, that you would just teach us what you think and that you would help us in this, this radical adjustment for this hour to embrace the nations coming to Christ and to celebrate everything we hear. We honor you for the testimonies today. Wow, 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 wow. Resurrections. Amazing. We honor you for it. Everybody said, Amen. Now, you remember when Jesus chose the 12, he met with them, and it says, He gave them power and authority. Do you remember that? It's in Luke 9. He gave them power and authority. I like to describe it this way. <clears throat> Jesus came commissioned from the Father. So he had all authority. When he was baptized in water, he came up out of the water and was clothed with the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit rested upon him in the form of a dove and remained. So I like to, I like to put it this way. Jesus came to earth having been commissioned from the Father to come take our place in death and be the sacrifice. He came with authority. I don't think he came with power. Now, as God, obviously, he's got all power. But the point is, as he chose self-imposed restrictions to live with the limitations of a human being, although he has access to everything as God. Make sense? Kind of? All right. So he came with what? Authority. How do we know? Because the authority comes in, your, the authority you walk in is equal to the, your submission to the commission. Authority is directly connected to the commission. I think Chris Valentin is the one who put it this way first. He said, co-missioned. You have to be in submission to the primary mission. That's how you're co-missioned. 
All right, does that make sense? So he came to earth with authority because he was commissioned by the Father. But he still needed to be clothed with power. And so he comes to John for water baptism. John says, I'm not worthy to untie your shoes. Jesus says, permit it. He baptized him in water. The Spirit of God comes upon him in the form of a dove and remains. So there he receives power. If you read in Luke chapter, the end of chapter 3, the beginning of chapter 4, it was after that water baptism where the Spirit of God came upon him. It was after that power was displayed, but not until then. All right? Now, fast forward. Jesus is at the end of his life. He's already commissioned the 12. There's 11 left. He's already given them power and authority. But what does he do? After he dies, he resurrects, he appears to them, and in Matthew 28, Jesus came and spoke to them, verse 18, saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. What are some of the things he commanded? Heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out devils. Here in the Great Commission, he's saying, teach your disciples what I commanded you, which includes healing and deliverance and all, all the other things. Yeah? I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. So the point I want to make is even though all 12 of his disciples, 11 remaining, even though they had already been given power and authority when Jesus was on earth, I like to put it this way, they were deputized under his mantle of anointing, of call of anointing, his power and authority. So they functioned under the umbrella of his gift. I've seen it happen, so I, I, we don't have, I, I, I could take time, but Absolutely. I'd end up killing all of you, so <laughs> don't, don't do it. But, but I've, I've seen it where, yeah. where you work with someone in their gift, and, and their anointing actually affects you, and as long as you're with them, you function like them. And you think you've got it, and then you try to do it on your own. And, <laughs> it doesn't work well. It's, 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 it's like a wake-up call. Oh, so, so that anointing wasn't mine. Yeah, yeah, you, you, yeah. It's, it just, you, you, have, you, just, you just pay a price for those things, that's all. And uh, so anyway, um, so here's Jesus. He comes back and he, the first thing he does is he tells them they have authority. Well, I thought they already had authority. Yeah, they were deputized under his, but now they've got to have their own. So what does he do? First thing he does <clears throat> is he appears to them. He says, all authority has been given to me, therefore go. What is he doing? He's imparting authority for the mission. The great co-mission. And then he says, don't leave Jerusalem until you're clothed with power. I thought they already had power. Yep, they were deputized. Now they have to get their own. Now they have to get their own. You remember Jesus told his disciples, it's better for you that I go. I doubt there was one disciple that believed that. <laughs> because they've got him right there. I mean, they've got him right there. They can ask him anything. He corrects them. It's, you know, it's the only time they were embarrassed and felt good about it. You know, it's, it's like Jesus just adjusted itself in their lives. And it was just continuous. And he said, it's better that I go. And then he made this, Jesus made this statement, John, I think it's 14. He says, the Holy Spirit who, his, who is with you will be in you. The Spirit of God who is with you will be in you. And that's what he was announcing. So in John 20, he breathed on them. They received the Holy Spirit. And then he said, but we're not done. Don't leave Jerusalem until you've been clothed with power. <clears throat> One of the kind of bizarre stories in scriptures of Gideon 
I want to have you turn to this one. It's in chapter 7 or 8. I think it's chapter 8. It's on the right-hand side of the page, but it's right at the top, first column. <laughs> and it says, in my translation, New, New King James says, and the Spirit of God came upon Gideon, and it was an extraordinary feat that was accomplished. But in the footnote, it says, literally, it means the Holy Spirit clothed himself with Gideon. I said I wasn't going to turn there, but some of you don't believe me, so I'm going to. The Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon. He blew the trumpet. The soldiers gathered to him, etc. It says, the Spirit of the Lord clothed himself with Gideon. If an Old Testament concept of the Holy Spirit clothing, uh, it was Michael Thompson who told us this 20, probably 7, 28 years ago. He said, the Holy Spirit in this passage put Gideon on like a glove. That's what we need. It's for the Spirit of God to put us on like a glove. It's got to fit well. That glove can't have a mind of its own. That glove can't have a preconceived idea. This is what it needs to look like. It's actually, it's got to be supple, tender, very flexible. So that as the Holy Spirit puts you on, puts me on, he does what he wants. So he tells them in Luke 24, don't leave Jerusalem until you've been clothed with power. Now let's go to Acts chapter 1. And I'll start, I'll start wrapping this up. Now remember, we started uh, this thing tonight by just this one concept, this most difficult to comprehend concept of God wanting to fill us yes. with yes. his yes. fullness. Yes. I can't think about that very long because it'll hurt my head. <laughs> so Acts chapter one, verse two, until the day in which he was taken up after he through the Holy Spirit was given, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen to whom he also presented himself alive after suffering by uh, many infallible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So what's the point? After his resurrection, he kept appearing and reappearing to the 11 disciples and others outside of the uh, original group. He would appear to them over a period of 40 days. Pentecost means 50. So from the death of Christ to the day of Pentecost is 50 days. But he spent 40 hanging out with the guys. Which means there was 10 days that they had a prayer meeting. So he says, don't leave Jerusalem till you're clothed with power. I wonder what they did in those 10 days. <laughs> 10 days is a long prayer meeting. They already have been competing with each other, <laughs> thinking they're better than the other. So they, they got 10, it probably took them 10 days to get this stuff kind of fixed. <laughs> Just throw them in a prayer room and don't, leave, don't let them get out, you know? And uh, the Peter, you know, he already said, I love, I love you more than all these. And so Jesus showed up, said, do you love me more than these? And so they had a few things to kind of work out in this prayer meeting. It's interesting, Jesus actually appeared, the scripture says, to f over 500 people announcing what was to happen. We don't know how, long, how many people were in the room when the prayer meeting started, but we know 10 days later there was 120. Wow. 
What were they, what did Jesus talk to his disciples about during the 40 day period? The kingdom of God, that's the message. Being assembled together with them, verse four, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you've heard of from me, for John baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. When they had come together, they asked him saying, Lord, <clears throat> will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said, it's not for you to know the times or season which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Twice the disciples brought up conversation and asked questions, and twice Jesus turned the subject to the kingdom of God and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. There's a tremendous book. Um, I, we have copies somewhere. I, I'm going to promote one of these days. It's called The Cure of All Ills. And, you know, I, I did this study years ago on... Um, on water, uh, uh, rivers, uh, pools, uh, lakes, rain, those kinds of things. And it, it, the conclusion I came to is all through the Old Testament, Israel would have a problem with an enemy army. They would have a problem with moral breakdown in their own culture. They would have a problem with following after other gods. It didn't matter what the problem was, God's answer was rain, rivers, pools, which in that context is always the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So it's like, it, it's like, it doesn't matter what problem you have, what you need is God. It's a cure-all. In other words, there, there actually is a simple answer to every problem. You need an immersion in the Spirit of God. It doesn't mean you don't need counsel. It doesn't mean you don't need this, you don't need that. But what you need most of all, what we need, what I need, is an immersion in the presence because everything becomes settled. Everything becomes settled in the presence. Verse 8, he says, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in Judea, Samaria, to the end of the earth. Many people think that Jesus' final words to the church was, go into all the world, preach the gospel, disciple nations. It wasn't his last words. His last words were, wait in Jerusalem until you receive the promise of the Father. Wait in Jerusalem until you're clothed with power from on high. The go is essential. The wait prepares us for the going. And the whole point of the waiting is there is something more than what you've seen to this point. There is something more that God has in store for you. Imagine yourself one of the 11 remaining disciples and Jesus appears to them. One of the moments he appeared to them is in John 20 where they were hiding in a room thinking they were going to be killed next. If you can imagine the hostility of the hour, they are literally afraid for their lives as they hide out in this room. Jesus always knows where we are. And so he just appeared walking through the wall, however he got there. They were, that didn't help the fear issue at all when uh, somebody just appears and they didn't know it was Jesus. So you got to keep that in mind. Jesus just appears in this room. They, their fear just got com compounded and they are terrified. And Jesus says, peace to you. That didn't help because they were, they're in way too much fear to receive any kind of peace. And so Jesus showed him the scars in his hands, his side, his feet. When they saw that, they recognized this is Jesus. We saw him crucified. As soon as they realized that, they, they began to experience the peace that Jesus promised. And he said again to them, again to you, I say, peace to you. This is important to realize. In this moment, of ab sometimes we're so filled with fear and terror that, that we can't find peace. And yet it's, it's here. 
It's here. There has to be a turning. And what happened in the hearts of the disciples, there was a turning. They recognized, oh, it's Jesus. He is with us. And when he spoke peace the second time, he breathed on them. The Holy Spirit came upon them and they received true peace. All right. Here's, here's the deal. Jesus gave them in that decree, go into all the world, preach the gospel. He gave them a commission. What else did he give them in the commission? Our response, our yes to the commission of God is what connects us to the authority of God. They were given authority in that moment. But then he said, wait in Jerusalem. Why? Because we need both authority and power. That is how Jesus ministered. It's how the disciples ministered when they were deputized under Jesus's anointing. They were deputized. If you remember in Luke 9, Jesus gave his disciples power and authority. He gave them both to function in while he was on the earth. But when he left and went to the right hand of the Father, they had to find once again this place of authority and this place of power because now they were going to do it without Jesus being at their side. I remind you of something that I think is, is so critical, so important. One of the comments that Jesus made to his disciples that I'm sure was about the most difficult thing to comprehend they've ever heard him say. He said, it is better for you that I go. Now imagine that. They've spent three and a half years with Jesus. They can ask him anything. They are constantly impacted by his actions, his words. They learn from his behavior. Everything is an overwhelming three and a half year school of discipleship. And in this moment of of absolute adoration. They want to sit at his right hand, at his left. They want to be there as he takes a dominion over the kingdoms of the world. And they're all positioning themselves to be a support to this Messiah. And then he says, it's better that I go. I can't imagine hearing anything in their position that would be more opposite of what they would normally feel. He said, it's better that I go because if I don't go, I can't send the Holy Spirit to you. Here's the deal. Picture this, you're one of the 11. Jesus is at your side. At any moment, you can reach out and touch him. You can ask him a question. You can receive instruction. He is there just guiding you with his eyes even, the way he does life. There's a constant lesson of what it is to know God, to follow God. He's right here. And yet that one who is right here said, it's gonna be better if I go because I'll send the Holy Spirit. So here's the challenge. Is your relationship with the Holy Spirit better than if Jesus were standing at your side. If it's not better, then we're not utilizing what God actually provided for us by giving us the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit that rests upon us. This is what we were assigned to. We were assigned to this. The gospel of the kingdom of God, Paul says, is not in word only. It is in power. There must be the demonstration of power. Power in our personal life to overcome a sin, temptation, those kinds of issues. But it's power for the miraculous. It's power to confront the impossibilities of life. This is what we are assigned to live in, to walk in, is to walk in the absolute power of God, to demonstrate the resurrection of Jesus. Every time you and I pray for someone and there's a miracle, it's a demonstration that the resurrection of Jesus is real. If I pray for you and you experience a miracle, you've just seen what God can do. If I pray for you and nothing happens, you've just seen what I can do. It's the absolute clothing with power that makes it possible for us to demonstrate the reality of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. When we get to Acts chapter one, we see twice in the first few verses him talking about the kingdom of God. All of you parents know that when you're about to leave the house and your your kids are in the house, you have final words of instruction. Maybe they are staying with their grandparents. Maybe they're staying with uh, a babysitter. But you have final words of instruction. The final words are your most important words. That's what they you want them to remember before you leave for the evening or for a week, whatever it might be. Jesus' final words to his disciples 
was instruction in the context of wait was instruction about the kingdom of God. It says in verse three, the last part, he says, he spent 40 days speaking to them of things pertaining the kingdom of God. The very next words out of his mouth, um, excuse me, the very next thing out of his mouth is he says, John baptized with water, you will be baptized in the Holy Spirit, not many days from now. So the disciples then say, hey, I got a question. When are you gonna restore the kingdom Uh, when are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And Jesus says, it's not for you to know the times, but, excuse me, but you shall receive power, verse eight, when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses. What's the point I want to make? Twice in chapter one is the conversation about the kingdom of God. Once it was in his instruction. Second time, it was their question. When are you restoring the kingdom to Israel? Both times, the very first subject he turns to after talking about the kingdom of God was the baptism in the Holy Spirit. I'd just like to suggest, use this as kind of a springboard. I'd just like to suggest that the introduction to the realities of the kingdom of God is the baptism in the Holy Spirit. It immerses us into a reality. And this is available for everyone. This is not haves and has not. I, I, I don't like that, that, that whole argument, that whole concept. This is available for everyone who confesses Christ, that the spirit of God would come upon us. He'll manifest differently. But the point is, Jesus is represented well. That's what we're looking for, that Jesus is represented accurately for who he really is. I want you to move fast forward now to verse 14. Verse 14 says, these all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus and his brothers. Now this is an interesting verse. We know from the rest of the chapter, there's around 120 people. So let's just say 120 people, which is interesting to me because Jesus elsewhere in scripture says, after his death, he appeared to over 500 people but there was only 120 in the prayer meeting. I don't know where the 380 went. I'm sure they got it later. I just don't wanna miss when he shows up. I don't wanna miss. So here they are, it says they continued in one accord in prayer. It's established that the prayer uh, out of unity had been taking place in this chapter. This is extremely significant. Look who attended the meeting. Of course, we have here Mary, the mother of Jesus, uh, some of the women that were supporters, and his brothers. Why is that important? Because one of the last times we read about his brothers, they didn't believe he was the Messiah. And they tried to trick him into going into a public place to receive ridicule and opposition. So something has happened during this journey where they've come to the realization they've spent all this time growing up with the Son of God in the house. Imagine that realization. You've also got the 11 uh, disciples who spent their time, three and a half years, succeeded in ministry for sure, but they were also caught comparing themselves with one another, thinking they are better than the other, arguing as to who was the greatest. So we've got this accumulation of 120 people who have many issues throughout their life together. And yet this 10 days of prayer I don't know if they settled the issues before, the, before they started the 10 day prayer meeting or if they got ironed out in the prayer meeting. Do you remember when G- Peter denied Jesus and Jesus shows up afterwards and he says to Peter, do you love me more than these? I think he was asking, Peter, do you love me more than the other remaining 10? Do you, do you, do you, do you really think you love me more than everybody else? Because there was this, this arrogance, this superiority, this, this thing that rose up in him to think everybody else is going to blow up, but not me. I'm, I'm the most secure one here. And Jesus confronted that in him, and it was in that repentance that he was fully restored. So let's get back to the story here. They continued in one accord in prayer. My translation adds the word and supplication. Let me talk to you for just a moment about the issue of prayer. Our prayer life reveals how conscious we are of the God who is with us. You can't have someone as glorious and significant as the Spirit of God resting upon a person 
and have that person not talk to him. The depth of our prayer life reveals the level of awareness we have to the Spirit of God in our lives. I'm not talking theologically. All of us as believers can say, we know that the Holy Spirit lives in us. We know that the Holy Spirit walks with us. He guides us. He teaches. I get that. I know that. I'm talking about the daily ongoing consciousness of the Holy Spirit of God. David said in the Old Testament, he said, I daily set the Lord before me. It's not that we can position God where we want. He's, he's, he's not under our command. We are under his. But David was saying he's everywhere, so I turn my attention to God being with me. And that consciousness of God in his life is what in many ways enabled him to be the greatest king Israel ever had. So let's get back to the subject. The second thing I want to challenge you in, for most people, our prayer life are times where we're pursuing comfort, pursuing peace, Uh, The pleasure of the Lord. Now, comfort, pleasure. Let's just take those two words. Those are biblical concepts. God is the one who designed pleasure. He is the one who designed comfort. He is the one who, who made us to be able to rest in him. I'm accepted in the beloved. He delights in me. I'm his treasure. I'm the apple of his eye. All those things are absolutely 100% true. But what happens when we distort our pursuit of comfort We sacrifice having a lifestyle of impacting prayer. There are prayers of fellowship with Lord, which is refreshing, reassuring, building hope, building faith. But the Apostle Paul taught at one point about prayer being likened unto giving birth. He actually said, and I'm in labor for you until Christ is formed in you. And he was, uh, the context there was prayer. So think about this. This is an awkward uh, subject, but it's, it's, it's the intensity of prayer. And for those who only pursue a relationship with God of comfort and pleasure will never know the kind of prayer that moves mountains. You have to be able to feel the grief of the Lord the pain of a situation. As parents, we know what that is, to be in a a painful situation with our children. But here's the vital thing, is we come before the Lord and we pray unto, until it is lifted, until there is that sense of breakthrough. Most believers have greater faith in the return of Christ than they do in the power of the gospel. And the concept behind that statement is the fact that we know Jesus is coming back and when he does, he'll fix everything. Instead of us believing that the power of the gospel that's been given to us is what fixes everything. Instead of him returning to fix stuff, maybe he's coming to pick up what is fixed. So, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And then he uses this phrase, a mature man, a perfect man. I don't know, this is mind boggling. This uh, This is troubling. He actually has put us on a course that says, this is where you're going to end up. You, the people of God. And the world gets a bigger mess and the church gets more divided and he still hasn't changed his plan. He still hasn't said, "Uh, too much work. (laughs) Never mind. I'll just come back and fix it myself. He he, he just didn't do that. He just didn't do that. I'm fascinated by, well, by everything Jesus did, but a story that stands out to me in this moment is the fact that Jesus, <clears throat> the disciples had come to him saying the, crowd's, the crowd needs to go home. We have no food. They're starving. Send them away. And Jesus said, you feed them. 
which is just a classic moment because you got to imagine the disciples are waiting for him to laugh and hit him on the shoulder and say, just kidding, you know, <laughs> after, after he gives this command. But he doesn't. he doesn't. He doesn't break into laughter. He says, you feed them. And, and they're nervously trying to figure out how in the world can we do that. If we had the food, we, we couldn't do that. And so Jesus, all he does is he, he gives them he gives them something to do. He says, have the people sit down in groups of 50 and 100. Okay? Anybody have food here? Yeah, there's a kid with lunch. All right. So Jesus could have created up nothing, but he usually creates with something. It's fascinating that he, he easily could have just from nothing, but these miracles that we see in scripture actually started, he had something to work with. And so in John's gospel, when he talks about this situation, it said, when he broke the bread, when he gave thanks, he distributed it to the disciples and it, it became more than enough. But when he gave thanks, what did he give thanks for? He gave thanks for not enough. He gave thanks when it was way <laughs> insufficient. See, when you take what isn't enough and you baptize it in thankfulness, it becomes supernaturally positioned to be more than enough. It's the power of thanksgiving. It's the power of a thankful heart. An unthankful heart is, is imprisoned by numbers and limitations and restrictions. A thankful heart is positioned to see increase. In John's gospel, it says there were 5,000 men besides women and children. This happened at two different times. This is the multiplying of at least twice that we know of. And it says there were 5,000 men not counting women and children. Where did the loaves and fishes come from? From a child, someone who didn't count. You heard it in the video tonight with the Bethel Global Response where the Ukrainian people are saying, we, we, we thought the world forgot us, we thought even God forgot us. And he said, the world maybe has, but God hasn't forgotten. There's, there's, something, there's something profoundly significant by recognizing the value of an individual. And here Jesus honors a child. I don't know if there were other lunches that were there, it wasn't important. It was the one that was given to him was from a child and Jesus took and he didn't throw it in the air and go, Shazam. <laughs> I mean, let's, let's face it, crowd control. You don't, you don't create a mountain of food in front of a, thousands of hungry people. Instead, what he did is he divided it into 12 baskets and the disciples distributed. How much was in a basket? I don't know, that much? I don't know. But 12 baskets is not enough to feed 5,000 men besides women and children. Can we say 15,000 people? 12 baskets isn't near enough. Unless it multiplies as you're giving it out. So when Jesus said, you feed them, he didn't change his mind when they said, we have no food. He didn't change his mind when they were puzzled by the challenge. He didn't change his mind. All he did was enable them to do simple actions that he would bless and cause food to multiply. In other words, there's a point of obedience. Most miracles are connected to a point of obedience. And we usually wait for something to happen to us when oftentimes we're supposed to take faith and put it into an action. 
the blind man, go wash in the pool of Siloam. That's a cruel assignment for a guy who's blind. You've got to go to another geographical location and wash in a specific pool. But there was something in his makeup that needed, confronting is too strong of a word. It needed to be, there's something that needed to be exercised in him, in his obedience. So many times we see actions, we see blind Bartimaeus take off his beggar's robe. There's a, a profound action. It's what qualified him as a legal beggar in that culture. People would see that garment to know he was legitimately blind and needed help. So when he took that off, extraordinary act of faith. But actions have to take place. I, I, I remember through the years, so often I would, I would have people do something, um, not, uh, you know, if you've got a broken ankle, I wouldn't say stand up here on the stage and jump off to test and see if it's healed. Gabe might, but, but, but <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't do that unless he told me to. I wouldn't do it out of the principle of faith. P please listen to this carefully. I will not put anybody at risk out of the principle of faith. I at times will have to put myself at risk out of the principle of faith because I'm not getting a breakthrough but I, can't, I have no right to put you at risk. Let me illustrate it. Is it true that the widow gave her last meal to the prophet and that was the key to her economic breakthrough for the next season? Is it true? R read your Bibles because it's in there. And it's a really good story. So it's a, it's an, it's, it's a principle of faith. She emptied her own resources and gave to the prophet. I'm grieved at how often I hear people in this position use that to tell people that's what they need to do. You never put somebody else at risk. Unless he says so. And the most terrifying thing, I think, for that prophet was for him to bring a word to a widow who was down to her last meal. And he's got to tell her that the key to her breakthrough is you feed me first. Some would automatically think that's arrogance. I think it's the absolute greatest demonstration of humility because it's obeying to a point you make yourself look foolish. I want you to look uh, with me at uh, John chapter three. And I, I've talked about this so many times, I feel a little bit embarrassed doing it again, but I, it just, actually at the end of worship, I felt, like, I felt like I should talk to you about this. And I'll, I'll try to hurry through the parts I've done so many times. <clears throat> So when Jesus told his disciples, you feed them, and they were clueless as to what to do, they knew they didn't have enough. He didn't change the assignment. He just enabled them through simple step-by-step -step instruction, enabled them to do what was actually impossible. When Jesus says to you and to me, go into all the world, preach the gospel, disciple nations, you may be like me going, wait a minute. <laughs> all we've got is a kid's lunch. And if we'll listen further, he gives a step-by-step -step approach because he's not changing his plan. He's not gonna change his mind. He's not gonna say, all right, it's a little rough making you like me. I'll tell you what, I'll try to make you like John. <laughs> or Fred, you know, whoever. He doesn't change his plan. He's got, he's got an assignment for you and, and for me.